test is, uh, is what theory best explains the information embedded in DNA uh, where best is determined by what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. And what we, when, when uh, I mean, you and I both have a, a fascination with these experiments, the RNA world experiments. And what we find there is that the, the hottest theory of the origin of life, the, that is the, uh, the, the naturalistic uh, alternative to intelligent design, is relying heavily on so-called uh, ribozyme engineering, the attempt to get RNA molecules to perform certain uh, 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 but Stephen, tests you, you haven't answered my question. What, is that the test you're going to do? Is the, it right the, 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 the key test is: uh, uh, show me a process that generates information and large amounts of specified information without the guidance of an intelligent agent. These ribozyme engineering, uh, this ribozyme engineering work that I know you you are so interested in, as I, as am I, is guided by intelligence. Such such benefits, such improvements in the. Uh, the efficiency of, of replication, for example, that are achieved, and so far they're fairly minimal, are achieved because an intelligent agent is guiding that. That is a, if, so I say those experiments are actually simulating the power of intelligence, and only, and everything we know is that only intelligence produces information. So we test our theories against our knowledge of the cause and effect structure right. of the world. I want, to, I want to let Peter get, but let me add one follow up to you. Steve. Do you believe that intelligent design? has faced as rigor, rigorous a scientific test as Darwinian evolution? I mean, are they equal in terms of being put to the, the test? I think, first of all, there are many things that Darwinian evolution can explain. Okay. Uh, but there are some very key things that Darwinian evolution, and in particular, chemical evolutionary theory of the origin of the first life, cannot and has not explained. And I used to ask my students, um, if you want to give your, your, uh, your computer a new functionality, what do you have to give it? And the answer is, you have to give it new lines of code. The same thing is true in life. And so the, the fact that, that uh, these evolutionary theories have not been able to explain the origin of the first information is not a minor anomaly. This is a fundamental theory, a, a theoretical problem. It's a fundamental lacuna. Any theory that can't account for the origin of information, when, when we now understand that information runs the show in biology, is a theory that has a serious theoretical gap. But, but, okay, equal so, time, equal yeah, time. <sighs> He's just so smooth, though. I could sorry, I'll, I'll slow down. <laughs> uh, one of the beautiful things about science is it's predictive. And the biological theories that we call evolution, there are so many, predict many things. And they also produce things. Now, one of the great predictive aspects of this body of knowledge that we call evolutionary theory is that it is our first line of defense against something that I think affects every one of us, infectious disease. We know that viruses mutate. We know that bacteria evolve. We have to stay one step ahead of that. And I would suggest that all who really, if you really believe in intelligent design, you're not allowed to use antibiotics. Oh, that's, that's not true. <laughs> it's forever taken away from you. You're not allowed to have this stuff. So my point here, Steve, is what can, what is the predictive power that ID can do? What will it predict and what will it produce? Because what evolutionary theory has done has ended up an enormous number of predictions that have had huge power and have actually had material production. What can ID do along those lines? That's a great question. Let me give a couple examples. Um, for a few, few of you may have grabbed our handout on the way in. Um, you may know that there's an ongoing debate about the origin of the molecular machines in the cell, the bacterial flagellar motor, uh, this little rotary engine that Michael Behe has made famous in his book Darwin's Black Box. He's been a, um, uh, critiqued by Ken Miller, a biologist at Brown University, uh, Behe's at Lehigh. Looks for all the world like a scientific debate. Um, Miller has noted that there's a little uh, syringe uh, like pump that has many of the same protein parts that make up a bacterial flagellar motor. Miller argues that that syringe is uh, an ancestral form of the flagellar motor. Behe argues that it's a degenerative uh, product of the genetic information that made the motor as a whole. Now, th th that leads, that's a chicken or egg question, which came first? And that's a very testable question. Which of those two systems is older? Which is younger? And papers are beginning to come in on this, one by Milton Sayer recently, uh, actually favoring Behe's position, although somewhat tentatively. Uh, my colleague Scott Minnick at the University of Idaho, a microbiologist, is doing a number of, uh, of experiments to test this very thing. We think there's very strong evidence that the flagellar motor is ancestral, or uh, yeah, the, the, the motor as a whole and the genes that made it are ancestral, and that the, the um, 
the, the type 3 secretory system, as it's called, is a, is a, is a, is a byproduct of that and, and derivative of that. For one thing, the, the, uh, the, the genes for building the type 3 secretory system occur on little plasmids that are derivative from other genomes. Uh, there's several cases of this, but it's all the, the same conclusion. So it's very simple. There's an argument. There's a critical test. Which is, which is younger, which is older? There's a number of ways to test that, phylogenetic studies and so forth. Michael Behe's ID theory is very testable. Okay, let's go back and let me ask the question again. I see why he's got such a pretty face. It's like Muhammad Ali. He <laughs> dodges and weaves. This is great. Um, tell me what, what are the predictive powers of ID? What can it give us? If it's a scientific theory, there will be predictions that accrue. What are they going to be? Well, I just made one, first of all. So secondly, really... I'll give a couple others. Okay. okay. Uh, when, we, when we talked last on, was it Dory, right? Dory Monson? Dory okay. Monson. Uh, I talked about the, the whole issue of junk DNA. Okay. There are two very important papers that have come out in the last year saying that neo-Darwinism has been heuristically unfruitful with respect to the whole question of these non-coding regions of the genome. Heuristically genial. unfruitful. It's exactly what you're asking about. Okay. What, you know, has it made good predictions that have led us to new discoveries, or has it led us down a blind alley? Conclusion, uh, James Shapiro, Richard von Sternberg, it's led us down a blind alley. It says, neo-Darwinism says, hey, if uh, you know, observes that there's big sections of the genome that don't code for proteins, because we assume that genetic is in information is produced by a trial and error process, uh, then we would assume that there'd be, there'd be a lot of so-called junk DNA. That was the, the first conclusion Crick drew in, the, in 1980 about it. Well, it's turning out that there's lots of hidden functions in that non-coding region, which is exactly something that we would predict from a design theoretic point of view, because we don't think information was produced by a higgledy-piggledy trial and error process. But couldn't that as easily just be the fact that science is now getting better and better in understanding the huge complexity of DNA? Science is not truth. We're adding information all the time, and we're constantly changing ideas and hypotheses. I, I, I mean, this that. idea yeah. of junk DNA, it was called junk DNA because a generation ago, the people looking at this had not had a very poor understanding of how things work at that particular level, and there's less and less junk in that DNA now. But this the, is not the, something The theoretical that framework predicts. of Darwinism did lead us down to bl a blind alley, but let me, let me give you another example. What is My Darwinism? Colleague, well, uh, it's the... You, yeah. uh, let, let me give you another example, rather than define terms that's... See, I don't know what Darwinism is, though. Uh, it's the synthetic theory of, yeah. Um, well, well, tell me, just, can you define Darwinism? We should, we, and we should, I want to talk about it, but let, let well, it, I want to answer his main, his main finish, question about predictive answer, capacity. Answer, but then let's talk about my, that. Go ahead. A couple years ago, Bruce Alberts had an article in Cell saying that to be effective cell biologists in the, in the age of molecular machines, we need, to be tra we need to be training our students as design engineers. And uh, my colleague Jonathan Wells has, has taken that up with some seriousness, and he says, I'm inter he's interested in a particular form of cancer. He has a hypothesis about what has caused it, and he is applying principles of design engineering to understand the, the functioning of centrioles. He hypothesizes that they are functioning on the same principles of turbines. They not only look like turbines, but they actually are turbines. He's had a Boeing engineer help him work up some of the, the mathematical calculations, and he's now able to explain some of the effects that may be responsible for a particular form of cancer. So he's using an explicitly designed theoretic framework to guide his research into, in, 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 in hopes that we discover some, some, some new things that but we wouldn't you, have otherwise. You've lost me. How does that relate to intelligent design? He's, he's treating, he, he's not just saying, as a, as a Darwinian would do, things look designed, but they're not really designed. He says, no, they really are designed, so I'm going to apply principles of mechanical engineering to try to, to guide my search for other uh, unknown structures in the cell. He's using design as a positive guide to discovery. Peter, can I ask you?